No federal act, no law, executive order, no policy ever changes the nature of property and economic activity and development in the United States more dramatically than the Emancipation Proclamation, which Lincoln issues in the fall of 1862. Now, if you know what some people have said about the Emancipation Proclamation, this might seem like a strange statement, because the Emancipation Proclamation has often been criticized for not doing that much. Many have said, well, it only frees the slaves that are in southern controlled areas. And if you read the text, you will see that that is, in fact, technically what it does. And of course, the whole point is that the United States government doesn't control those areas. Those areas are in rebel hands. So some have said the Emancipation Proclamation just doesn't free any slaves at all. Karl Marx famously claimed that it was obviously the work of a lawyer since it was so legalistic. And a great American historian said it had all of the moral grandeur of a bill of lading. But nonetheless, the Emancipation Proclamation committed the national government to a policy of freeing the slaves as a war goal. And this would only be undermined, underlined by the 13th Amendment, which was passed in early 1865. And to understand the emancipation that happens during the Civil War, a lot of which is driven by the actions of enslaved people themselves, it's still helpful to look at emancipations that happen elsewhere, particularly the ones that happened in the 1830s and the other really big capitalist country that owned slaves in the 19th century. And here I'm talking about Britain and the British Empire, uh, in which over a million people were enslaved until 1834 when Parliament freed them. Now, the logic that was used by policymakers in London to justify emancipation, which after all was taking property away from thousands of wealthy British individuals, people who had connections in the government, people who were powerful, the logic that was used to justify this was the argument that free labor is more efficient than slave labor. Remember that argument? We've heard that before. That's inherent in Adam Smith, who we often think of as one of the, you know, the, the founders of uh, capitalist idea, ideology and ideas. The problem was it hadn't worked out that way in Jamaica and in other Caribbean colonies. Formerly enslaved people, when emancipation came, did not want to work on sugar plantations anymore. They preferred to go find unclaimed land and settle there as individual farmers and make what uh, agricultural historians call uh, the choice of subsistence first farming to produce their own food and their family's food first. The sugar economy in the British Caribbean collapses after emancipation. Northern policymakers, as they move towards making emancipation a war goal, don't want that to happen. So as soon as the U.S. Army gets into large plantation zones, uh, major plantation zones like the South Carolina Sea Islands or the Louisiana Sugar and Cotton Country. And they do this by early 1862. These policymakers want to implement structures which keep enslaved people from leaving the plantation. And in particular, they want them to continue to make cotton which is the most important export still that the U.S. economy has. So they essentially force formerly enslaved people, even after the Emancipation Proclamation, to remain on cotton plantations. And they block them from getting their own land or taking over the land of Southern planters, even if those Southern planters are fighting in the rebel army. By late 1862, the U.S. government has committed itself to a pro-emancipation policy. It has also committed itself to signing up African Americans as soldiers in the U.S. Army. The 200,000 uh, African American soldiers, many of whom are former slaves, who sign up and fight on the Union side are probably the margin between defeat and victory. And their service is very, very important in making the political argument for the 13th Amendment, which universalizes emancipation across the entire country including in slaveholding states like Kentucky that had, to some extent, fought on the Union side. And also, uh, their service is tremendously important in passing the 14th Amendment, which makes 
African-American citizenship, African-American male citizenship, universal, and at least on paper, equal to the citizenship of white Americans. But federal government policy never wavers from the idea that African-American former slaves should continue to work as landless plantation laborers. The land of rebel slave owners is never to any large extent confiscated. It is never given to the formerly enslaved. In fact, in the wake of the war and the fall of the South, the federal government sends uh, Freedmen's Bureau agents, as they're called, into the South to try to negotiate work contracts between former slave owners and former slaves. They commit themselves to the idea that cotton production will continue and that landowners will continue to own the land. Formerly enslaved will have only their labor to sell. 